Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Brian. And uh, it's good to see those of you here, especially those of you in the ministry of the Lord, and uh, those of you who have been so hungry for God. And again, I remind you that the most important person in the room tonight is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, He's always here in our midst. And uh, it's just a matter of uh, us getting in contact with Him. And that's all that we want to do. But then it means that the most beautiful thing and the most wonderful thing in our life is to always get in touch with Jesus. To know how to reach out to Him. So let's go to God in prayer. Father, we just thank you. Father, teach us your word. The more we understand, the less we realize we know. There's so much more of you that we can know, that we can understand. Thank you for bringing each one of us to the place where we will completely depend on you and the Holy Spirit. And Father, we have so much of your word that has declared over and over again. It's not my mind, not by power, but by your Spirit. And we ask tonight, Lord, that you bring us into a new dimension of your Spirit. For you said there were two or three are gathered together in your name. There you are in the midst of us. And cause us once again to be able to experience you. Father, all that you have done is the greatest, greatest event in human history in sending your son Jesus. And all that Jesus has done is the greatest thing that you could have gave to us. And we are eternally grateful for all that Jesus has done. Father, 2,000 years of church history has taken place. And yet your people are as hungry as ever to see the light of the fullness of your glory that you have so reserved for this hour, for this time. It has been proclaimed from days of old that the last days has begun, O Lord, even for the time of the book of Acts. And Father, we know that as the time draws near to your coming, so much more your Holy Spirit works and so much more your angels work in our midst that we may know you, that we may love you. And tonight, Father, all that you have for us to receive, grant, O God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, that we may know the hope of your calling the riches of your inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. That we may know, O God, all the fullness of the glories that are in our inheritance in Christ. That we may know all the fullness of all that Jesus has for us. Tonight, Father, help us to experience Jesus again. For we know, Lord, that all things are possible to those who believe. In all that we need, in all that we desire, you are able to give. You are able to grant unto our lives. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. And revive us again, Lord, by your Spirit. Cause us, O Lord, to know the fullness of your Spirit. The ways of your Spirit. The workings of your spirit. The height, the depth, the length, the breadth, the width of all the love of Christ. And of all that your Holy Spirit has in store. We commit the meeting to you tonight. Hide me behind your cross, O Lord. That we may see and know only Jesus and Jesus alone. We lift Jesus high in our midst, O God. For it's him that we love. You that we love, O oh Lord Jesus, with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. And we just want to walk closer with you, to be the very manifestation of Christ to the world. Thank you, Father. Open our eyes that we may see Jesus tonight. Open our hearts and minds that we may experience Him tonight. 
and grant the working of your Holy Spirit in our heart and life. That we may receive the working of the Holy Spirit. For all that you do, Father, we give you the glory, the worship, and the honor. We thank you, Father. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Tonight, as we sit in this presence that God has brought upon our lives, let us uh, understand that between the natural world and the spiritual world is only a very, very, very thin line. In fact, if any one of us were to stop breathing right now, you straight away be in the spiritual world. It's a very thin line between the spiritual world and the natural world. But there are so many things that we could hinder the spiritual world and the dimension from flowing. We've been touching about three types of revival. And uh, we talk about the revivals that come by the refreshing of God. Revivals that come through the establishment of fivefold ministry. Revivals that come through church growth. And uh, as we come to this point tonight, we're going to talk about some of the common themes in all the different revivals. And tonight I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Whatever form of revival there is, if it is the first type where it comes with a refreshing from God, it's the stirring of the Holy Spirit from the throne of God. If it's that of the establishment of the fivefold ministry, it's because the fivefold have learned to listen to the Holy Spirit and position themselves and allow the Spirit to work in their lives. If it's church growth, whether we like it or not, if a church does grow and more people come to know Jesus, they have in some way found their obedience in the Holy Spirit. And they have obeyed God in some way to be able to harvest souls into the kingdom of God. We need to recognize that. And the most important person tonight as we speak about uh, the things of God is the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to take us from where we were last night in the book of John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Gospel of John chapter 14. Jesus talked about sending the Holy Spirit. And He is here in our midst. But the difference between receiving a miracle and not receiving a miracle is a very fine thin line. That we need to negotiate. In the book of John chapter 14, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit in verse 17. And says, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him, nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you, and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. And he continues to talk about the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, of which when the Holy Spirit has come, although we cannot see Him, we can know Him. In order to know the Holy Spirit, we need to be able to understand His language. The Holy Spirit does not speak. In human language, it gets translated as human language to the hearers. When the Holy Spirit ministers is spirit to spirit, we convert what we understand into whatever language that we are familiar with in our soul. So sometimes, for example, when God has a word, and let's say it's a comforting word where God speaks about how much He loves us. 
So a person could receive a word from the Lord, a prophecy or a tongue, an interpretation, where the person declares through the word of prophecy that God does love us, that God is a comforter, and God is uh, a great father who loves to embrace us. Another person might just receive a sense of comfort. Or let's say it's a little child who is receiving the same message, or a young child, and he tries to interpret the same message. The little child might say, God likes us very much. So the same message is translated into the understanding of each person. So God is beyond our language. When we all get into heaven, all the heavenly languages are there, some earthly languages, you know, slowly drop off. But God has the capacity to speak any language in the world, communicate any language in the world. We are not limiting God. But all those things are incapable of expressing all the fullness of God. God is beyond language. So when God speaks to us, we sense it in whatever form or language. And we come to know God in that manner. Now why is that important? Because it's in that dimension that we can know the Holy Spirit. How can you know a person unless you know the language that they operate in? And many times when God speaks to us, it is our language that limits us. It is our language that stops us from knowing God. And it is, for example, the simple gift of tongues and interpretation. It is an interpretation and not a translation. So it's not a literal word for word translation. It's an interpretation. And that interpretation will be filtered through the receiver all the time. In the same way as the word of knowledge and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are flowing forth from the Holy Spirit will be filtered through our understanding. Which is why our understanding, that power of understanding, that it's very important for it to be renewed. And uh, I need to lay some groundwork in as we talk about the things of the Holy Spirit. And this groundwork, um, they are found in uh, one of my books, which is online, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Where all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Bear with me as I lay a bit of groundwork. First Corinthians chapter 12 lists the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, divided into three groups. So, for example, the first group is revelation gifts that reveal something. So you have the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. They reveal something. And uh, then you have the power gifts which do something. The gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healings. And then you have the vocal gifts which say something. Give a prophecy, uh, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. All these nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are related to nine f fruit or growth of the human spirit. Which is many times what people don't realize and they mix the two together. And uh, for example, the word of wisdom is a word from God's wisdom of His plans, of His purposes, which is uh, defined as a revelation of God given to reveal things in the future. The word of knowledge is defined as a revelation of God, of His knowledge of things present or past. Discerning of spirits is just the ability that God gives to discern or see into the spiritual realm. Not necessarily just the negative realm, but also of the positive realm of angels and of God. The word of wisdom is different from spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom, we can grow in spiritual wisdom. We are taught in James chapter 5 to ask for wisdom. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask from God. The word of God produces wisdom. Colossians 3 verse 16 tells us, Be filled 
uh, let the word of Christ fill you, and then uh, not the, all the wisdom of Christ fills us, and then we are filled with such wisdom that we speak in psalm scenes and spiritual songs. Christ's word, the word of God has wisdom. It produces growth in spiritual wisdom, because we're not talking about the wisdom of the world. We're only talking about the wisdom, spiritual wisdom. The, there is a difference between the word of knowledge and spiritual knowledge. The Word of God gives us knowledge. We grow in spiritual knowledge. There is a difference between the gift of discerning of spirits and discernment. Spiritual discernment is mentioned in Philippians chapter 1, where Paul prayed that the church would grow in spiritual discernment. Because all these qualities come by growth. Next year, if you grow proportionally, you will have more wisdom than this year. Next year, you will have more spiritual knowledge than this year, if you keep growing in God. Five years from now, you will have more spiritual discernment than you have now. We are growing. Our, remember, our spirit man is growing. Last night, we talked about how the presence of God can manifest in proportion to our inner man. The strength of our inner man. Which ties again to this growth of our spirit man. That's why I'm comparing the gifts and just laying a quick foundation quickly. And uh, then there is the gift of faith, which is a deposit given by God to a specific person for a specific time, for a specific task to perform. Then there is general growing by faith, Romans 10, 17. Hearing, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So there's a general growth of faith. And then you also have uh, the working of miracles, which is a special work of the Holy Spirit. And you have scriptures that promises that, if, that you can believe God for miracles. Mark 9 verse 23, all things are possible to him who believe. In Mark 11 verse 23, 24, about moving mountains. General promises of God. And you have the gifts of healings. Double plural. Plural on gifts and plural on healings. Which is, and all these nine gifts work as the spirit will. But the fruit of the, of, of the human spirit that grows in God. As we grow in God, in God's spirit, we are able to have more faith to pray for healing. Mark 16, verse 17, 18. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Which is a totally different realm. Because the same with uh, the gift of prophecy, which links to exhortation and growing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Which is for everyone in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19. And then there is tongues, which is a... Uh, a message given by God through an individual to the people in an unknown language. And you have prayer in tongues, which is uh, something that God gives us an ability from us to pray to Him in an unknown language which our mind doesn't understand. Can you see that when we have the prayer language of tongues, is from us to God? Doesn't need interpretation. The gift of tongues is from God to us. That's why it needs interpretation. But you can see that here in this area, it's a human spirit thing. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 and 15. If I pray, in my spirit pray, I pray in an unknown tongue. And I will pray with my mind, I'll pray with my spirit, Paul says. I'll sing with the spirit, I will sing with my understanding. So he's talking about something in which every believer, when they are baptized in the Spirit, have the ability to bring forth. And a lot of teaching out there confuse the two. That is why you have Christians who lump everything together and say, wait, there are scriptures that say not all speak in tongues. And then here are other scriptures that seem to show that everybody does. Because they cannot see that there are different categories. One is a prayer language to God. One is a message from God. But for the person speaking in tongues, 
Thanks is thanks. He doesn't understand as he delivers. You don't understand as you speak forth to God. In quality and essence, they are the same. But in application, demonstration, and in outworking, they are different. You begin to see this pattern. And the same way with interpretation of tongues. There is an actual gift of interpretation of tongues. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, when, you, when you, you, those who have a tongue, pray that they may interpret. Now, if there's someone with a gift of interpretation, why should I pray to be interpret? Unless he's talking about also a growth in understanding the interpretation of tongues. So when you put all these scriptures together, side by side, analyze every single one, leaving nothing out, you can only one conclusion. There are nine gifts of the Spirit that work as the Spirit will, and nine growth of the human spirit that comes by growth. They seem similar in essence and in quality, but in application, demonstration, operation, they are totally different. And it is possible it is possible that if you keep growing in God, your human spirit keep growing in God, that the level that you operate here is almost equal to someone operating a fresh gift there. For example, in terms of, let's say, the word of wisdom, which is a revelation that God gives of being something that is going to occur in the future. A revelation of things future. If you have spiritual wisdom, sometimes you could discern and know from a course of action or from counseling the future direction or how those things will take place by your spiritual wisdom in God. So, so our growth in God can come in the same way. In the same way with discernment and discerning of spirits. It takes a gift of discerning of spirits to discern the spiritual world. But as we grow in spiritual discernment, which is the actual Greek word found in Philippians 1, in Paul's prayer for the Philippians, that your love may grow in discernment. That as we grow in discernment, sometimes you could discern whether some things are happening of spirit or flesh, satanic or angelic, whether they are of God or of the devil. You might not need the gift of discerning of spirit to, to take place, but you could discern. Your discernment grows. Now what's the purpose for both then? See, as you grow, no matter how much you grow, God can always still act on top of that, to what you have grown. And so, a believer who actually keeps growing in the Lord, can sometimes function almost at the level that it looks like the gifts of the Spirit. Merely because they've been walking in God and growing in God. Of course, by the time they function with the anointing upon, with the actual gifts, it becomes way more powerful than the person can. So, for a simple demonstration, like uh, the gift of tongues, which is the simplest uh, gift to operate, and uh, that we could teach uh, people the difference between them. That even as we have tongues and interpretation of tongues, we could grow to the extent where in our spirit we are able to discern and sense, not with our understanding, but we are heart, whatever the sense, not the translation, the sense of what is being spoken. The Lord, the Lord God is here and calling unto you. That 
Do not doubt, my children, for I, the Lord, your God, and indeed in your midst. If you will hearken unto my words and my spirit, I will draw you and bring forth that which I have spoken to you in vision and in dream. Now, we could go on the whole night like that. We could just speak in tongues and interpret because it's a training of the spirit man. And I'm trying to use tongues as the simplest before we go to some of the other giftings of the spirit, of which you understand that when Jesus say where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's in the midst of us. Now if he's in the midst of us, he's doing something. Most of the time he's in the midst of us and we don't know what he was doing. We all have a good time, we feel good, and then we go home. We didn't hear him. We didn't discern him. Because we're either trying to hear in English, and some people think that Jesus speaks in English. Queen's English, if they want. And Paul wrote in Old King James. So every time they don't have a, they don't have a, thus says the Lord, then it's not of God. It cannot be, because uh, that's, that's not English. The Anglo-Saxon language was not around when the Bible was written. But it spoke in New Testament Greek. But it's important for us to understand that, let's say with tongues and interpretation, for those of you who experience in it, and you, and you grow up as leaders, as a pastor, at any time you're a pastor in a Pentecostal church, somebody somewhere may just give out a message in tongues. As a pastor, I'm always ready to interpret. If no one interprets. But, is I always wait for a chance for somebody else to interpret. And that grows because you grow as a spiritual leader. Take another example. Why in James chapter 5 does he ask, if anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and lay hand. Doesn't it imply that the elders, number one, know how to pray for the sick. Number two, have authority over sickness and diseases. Number three, they, do, uh, they can channel the gift of healing. Or the power of healing. A believer's are not doing healing. Whatever form. They are capable of doing that. Otherwise, why call them? So obviously, as we grow as spiritual leaders and our inner man grows, there are certain expectations. There is a nigh growth of the human spirit proportional to the nigh gifts of the Holy Spirit. Similar but yet different. But by operating in the growth experience, you open yourself to the gift experience. That's where we can train you. See, I, we cannot make the Holy Spirit do something He doesn't want to do. We cannot. Because the Spirit works as He will. He is still the boss. We are slaves of righteousness. God is still God. We are His Children and in ministry functioning as his servants. We cannot force God to do something or any meeting. We can choose to make God do what he wants. No such thing. Any preacher that comes to do that, they just overstep the boundary with God. And they enter into the flesh. So I would not in any meeting try to do something just because I'm expected to do it. You still have to wait for the Holy Spirit. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit. But my ability to yield and obey to the Holy Spirit is greater if I have training in my normal growth. Can you see that? And here is where we learn and we grow in our normal growth experience. The simplest, of course, is tongues. Most, and and strangely enough, many people attend Pentecostal churches and they have never been, been taught about tongues. Some are not, have not even been prayed over and baptized in the Spirit, and they don't even have the foundational teaching about the Holy Spirit baptism and the relationship of tongues. So a lot of them do not know that that's the starting point. When the Holy Spirit came down, Acts 2, verse 4, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit giving utterance was the starting point. 
or many other experiences. You see, why did God choose tongues? Well, we can give you some of our understanding, but primarily I believe, you know, it's because tongues goes beyond our understanding. If God has to wait until we understand everything, He might not need to, he, 2,000 years might not be enough. <laughs> you have to add many zeros to that. Two million years or more. So God has to accelerate some things. And He gives us an experience when we are baptized in the Spirit that goes beyond our mind and understanding. For the first time, we venture in the area where, hey, wait a minute. I have no understanding here. I only have the word for my guidance. The basic principles of the word. And many Christians need to be taught there. And I want to draw you forth from this most basic area. In learning to relate to the Holy Spirit. And why it is in the realm of tongues. Because I so chosen. As you all know, from the scientific world, uh, the speech center, which I don't want to go into, is a whole part of our entire nerve system, control system. That's another scientific, you can do your own scientific studies there. But from the spiritual, biblical point of view, James tells us how the tongue is so important. It guides and influences the whole course of nature. And how important it was that every word spoken is so powerful. Many, many things you can learn. There are many enough preachers out there teaching the importance of words and tongues. And, and speech and everything else. But what we want to bring forth is the mere area of speaking in tongues. Most Christians don't realize that that's their first entrance into the supernatural world. So even if your tongue sounds very funny, we are not laughing. You are not laughing. But even your tongue sounds funny. And I remember when I first spoke in tongues, I was a Baptist student. Got baptized in spirit. Got tongues without realizing it was tongues. Didn't have any scriptural teaching, the basis of tongues. And then when we launch for the charismatic ministry, everything was new. And I remember we used to pray long hours in tongues. And I got a bit frustrated because my tongues was three syllable. When you pray many hours three syllable <laughs> very boring. You know, you know, and then you go bada 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 you know, washing machine tongues. Now, why do you do it? Because you say the Bible says it's edify. Alright? So you want to be edified, you're sincere, you're young, and you just want to be edified. So you go, you know, you know, it sounds funny, but uh, at least, thank God, it was not like some choo-choo train tongues. You may have heard it before. So that's, that's a different, different tongue all together, right? So some people have that. And uh, forgive me, your tongues is like that, but to, to <laughs> beg your forgiveness. Right. Right. Well, we all have spoken in tongues in some manner. Some of us might not, if you have not uh, been baptized or, or got into tongues yet, do not worry. You know, it's, it will just come and, uh, and, and, and when, when the time is right, as you worship God, it just come. And as you associate and you pray for baptized in spirit, you can receive, you can have it even uh, before you leave tonight. But basically, it's important for us to understand that that is your first entrance into the supernatural. And as we begin to experiment and pray long hours in tongues, uh, one of the first things I, I struggle with God is God, hey, this three syllables, not good enough. <laughs> not good enough. I, I, it's terrible, I'm like a baby. You know? Third year in Baptist seminary. Like a baby still. And then God began to speak to me that the problem was my problem. As He always does. You know, 
he tells, he always does that. He says the problem is not with the 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 substation, the power station, or the reservoir where the electricity being generated. Power is for somewhere on our connection side. And he began to show me, and he teach me, and then I began to understand. Began to, uh, I am a, I came from a very scientific background, so. Begin to, the Lord began to speak to me and show me scriptures. I study every scripture I could in tongues. And then I realized that speaking in tongues is, in, we're not talking about uh, the de- demonic area, where, where demons can possess a person and speak in an unknown tongue, but a person who is speaking is not conscious. And the person is totally possessed. Whereas when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we allow the Holy Spirit speak through us, we are fully conscious. Our free will is still intact. Acts 2 verse 4 operate. All he does is he gives us the utterance. But you are moving your tongue. You are using your voice. You are opening your lips. You can ask anyone here. If you don't speak in tongues, you can ask another one next to you who speaks in tongues whether, is it really that way? <laughs> it is. If they say it's not that way, then we have to catch them and check whether it's <laughs> come out in Jesus' name or something like that. Right? So, it is really that way. And so, when you begin to realize that, that we have so much control, then I realize that when we speak in tongues, we control the loudness and the softness. You can speak in tongues softly. We have some control. It's not like we don't have control. Of course, some people get excited when they're baptized in the Spirit or they're young in the Lord and say, Oh, Pastor, I cannot control. I cannot control. When you can't say, Come. They just need a bit more training. Now, the reason we touch on all this is when the Holy Spirit really starts moving. There is always an element of flesh mixed with the spirit. And if we want the pure stream, we must know which is which. And if we are over eager to, to, to allow everything under the sun, then, you know, everything under the sun really does come. <laughs> which you might not want. And so we need to realize that, now, we need to allow certain room and liberty. It's always a balance in each church and in each movement. The Holy Spirit is going to bring forward a mighty revival here in New Zealand and in the Southern Hemisphere, in Australia. But when it comes, we need to learn to negotiate it. And I believe this coming wave is going to be pure because we will have training and understanding of how to tap on its purity. And we will understand when it's excitement and all that. It's, it's a balance. We, we cannot... Hold it too, too, too down so that you remove people's natural enthusiasm and allow them some liberty in expressing themselves. But at the same time, you cannot over encourage it to the extent that it's a duplication of sometimes external fleshly things where you lose the, the virtue and the content of the pure spirit. So it's always a balance in every revival that God brings about. And uh, it takes a brave pastor or minister to say, this is actually not of God or this is of God. And, but it also, uh, we also need to be responsible to allow some leeway. As any good pastor knows that you know, when a member is very enthusiastic, want to do everything, you don't kill the enthusiasm, you just channel it in the right direction. So we have some control, loudness, softness. We have even control of its uh, range. You can speak in tongues in bass. In high note. Right? We have full control. Right? We have so much control. And then I began to realize the only thing you cannot control is that that sense of the desire to utter the language. Everything else you have control. 
You, you can, you, you know, and we have to open our mouths. And it is us that is moving our tongue. It is not the Holy Spirit grab your tongue and move it for you. <laughs> right? Never. <laughs> we move our own tongue. We only have, we, we only cannot control the, the next word or the next language that actually wants to come out. Where it feels good to say those things. Right. It feels good to say those things. It, it feels exactly what you want to express from your heart. And that's important. Think about it in this way. Just a little sidetrack here. When we call in the name of Jesus and command healing to flow forth, or in the name of Jesus, command demons to leave, do you realize that the name of Jesus is pronounced in so many different ways and forms all over the world in different languages? So, how does the demon know and how does the Holy Spirit know? It's the sense of what you meant when you say the name. During the time of Jesus, the name Jesus was very common. There, there were other people. There was another person, in fact, in the New Testament, also called Jesus. So sometimes they say, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you. That's the one I, I met. Not the other one in Timbuktu. <laughs> uh, or in South America, you know. You go climb on the street in South America, you say, uh, Jesus! And you got a few thousand of them show up. <laughs> So how does the Holy Spirit know and the demon know to obey you? It is because when you say it in your heart, in your mind, you meant the one in the Bible. So he's answering, he's answering that prayer for healing or to cast out the demon, not because of the way you enunciate his name. We have been troubled if that was what it was supposed to be. So you say, you know, in the name of Jesus, you're slightly Texan, slightly American. In the name of Jesus, and uh, you no know, angels check with God and say, you know, is he referring to you? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we act? <laughs> and uh, you know, say, I don't think so. He he didn't pronounce my name exactly right. <laughs> It should be Jesus. But actually, in the Greek, it's Jesus. So, they don't have English in the Bible time. So, they still is command, you know, in the name, you know, Onoma, Jesus. The demons obey. Do we use Onoma, Jesus as, as a uh, special phrase or something? No. The essence of what they mean. Look at it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Indian, Yesu. Uh, one of the Chinese dialects, Yasu. Sound like Ba So, some of you. I'm commanding, I'm commanding demons to come out in the name of Yasu. <laughs> you think I'm selling you some soap? <laughs> How does the Holy Spirit and God knows, you know, what we're doing? Not by our enunciation, by your heart. The essence of what you intend. So in the same way, when the Holy, when, when we are speaking in tongues, I begin to understand. It's not necessary that your tongues is so precise. Although, it has been known to those who yield to God that they speak really in ancient languages and known languages in the world. When I understand those things, that is more the essence of what I'm releasing. And that I am in control of both the volume and uh, of those, the, you know, the pitch and in the control of, uh, of, of how extended it is. Then the Lord began to show me that for a lot of people, their own habits are holding back their tongues. I hope this helps you tonight because if your tongue is stuck in a certain syllable, it's your own habit. Just like some people are always speaking, I'm why. 
So when they get born again, but that's in the spirit, the habit of speech is still there. Like for example, I still retain some of my Asian accent. I couldn't help it. Came here when, you know, I haven't picked up your New Zealand accent or Australian accent. And uh, so, and in an accent, some are nasal, some use different movements more in certain language. So I found this. Since we are the one moving our tongue, we are the one moving our lips, we are the one using our voice, the only thing was the language that was coming out that we didn't control. It was that utterance, the, the urge to say certain things, the desire to say those things and release those sounds. Then I realized that some of the, my own, I began to understand, analyze, I, I hope that by conquering my situation, it helps you. Then I realized why I was stuck with three syllables. Because all I was allowing the tongue movement was enough, enough room where you can make three syllables. And when I realized that, that if I allow the length, the breath, the width, the height of your entire mouth, Oh, your, 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 you allow your tongue, the length, the breath, the width, the height of your, your, your big or small mouth, whatever. <laughs> the languages started flowing. I told you, I started enjoying my tongue for the first time. No longer embarrassed. And, and all I, I, then I found it changed languages. So some of you notice your tongue changed languages according to certain things. That it depends on the essence of which what I'm concentrating on. Sometimes when I, I'm more in the heavenly realm, it seems to be different language. Sometimes when I concentrate and I'm interceding and I'm looking at the picture of the world and praying, you know, sometimes different language comes like, I can't get it. The Lord's power and grace and mission go forth to His people there. So, I notice that suddenly it's just like uh, uh, if you allow a, square, a small square piece of paper to write things, you cannot write that much. But you allow the full length and freedom, length and breath, suddenly the Holy Spirit takes a different liberty. That's just a simple illustration with a simple gift of tongues. I want you to know that all the nine gifts of the Spirit have dimensions in which we could move in. The same with the word of knowledge that some people have what uh, already is becoming common. Where sometimes people, when they pray, they have a sense of heat coming upon their body. Right? Uh, sometimes they have their hands, their head. This is a very common experience. The only thing is people stop there. They don't know what to do with it. Just like tongues, they don't know how to go further. When I discover the, the blessing of praying in tongues, I prayed and prayed and prayed for 48 hours. I had a big jug of water. And uh, of course, refresh myself in between. I prayed in tongues for 48 hours just to see what happens. That's the curiosity that I had. And I prayed and prayed. At the end of 48 hours of prayer in tongues, non-stop, they didn't sleep. Right? Tongues was too powerful. Where he just enjoyed. At the end of 48 hours, suddenly it was like I saw in multiple dimensions. Like I saw the spiritual world and the physical world simultaneously. I started noticing it because I was in the room and I was praying and praying and enjoying myself. And somewhere between 24 hours and 48 hours, I think it's about halfway in the second day. I saw these demons running across the road. <laughs> I said, hey man, wait a minute, was that really... <laughs> And I look, I say, hey, this, this is a demon. Eh? Then I look, because, hey, I can see into the heaven and there were a lot of angels going about. And I started 
realizing that, hey, the spiritual world just opened. And I, could, I was like living in an open vision. It lasted, it lasted for about half a day after that. And uh, uh, why didn't it continue? It was not easy to live a natural life. Like, uh, for example, uh, we ha- I have a few responsibilities to do uh, during that time, you know, you drive in and out or pray in tongues, still pray in tongues. And uh, then, let's say you're, you're walking down a road and then suddenly you see this black pit that is right before you. You're not sure whether that's a spiritual hole or some pit, you know, of the demons, you know, were manifesting. Or is it a real hole in the natural? So, you know, of course, if it was a real hole, and I say, oh, that's a spiritual hole, and I go, boom, right? I'll be injured. But at the same time, if I start avoiding what I was seeing in the spirit, of things and, and the dark, dark areas and that, I will be walking in this manner, you know? <laughs> And you'll be looking at me wondering, why is this guy walking in that way? Huh? <laughs> Poor guy is one of those uh, people who are men- mentally, you know, <laughs> gone off. <laughs> so it was not easy to live a natural life in, in, in that way. Because you can't, I couldn't differentiate spiritual reality and natural reality. The two got two mixed up. But it was quite an experience. And, and I realized that there's something there, just in the gift of tongues, and uh, that if we could learn to differentiate the two, we could live in those dimensions properly. So that when you need to come back to the natural, you're in the natural, you need to go back to the spiritual, you function the spiritual dimension. And that was where I discovered uh, those things apply to the other uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's where sometimes some of you, as you pray, you sense certain things and you didn't know where to go from there. You stopped. You, you, you didn't know that there's a spiritual growth being enhanced by the gifts of the Spirit where you could go on deeper into the things of God. And all the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit flow, flow through your five spiritual senses. In the Bible, I give you the scripture that everything in the natural is made from a pattern in the spiritual. So the spiritual is first and then the natural. In, in Romans chapter 1, it says the whole creation was made pattern after the attributes of God. And uh, we know in Hebrews 11, it tells us that by faith we know that the things which were made were made from things which were not seen, from the invisible realm. And we know also in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 4 that uh, Paul talks about those things that are seen are temporal. Those things that are not seen, they are eternal. So everything in the natural was patterned after the spiritual. In a similar manner, all our five senses were actually patterned after spiritual senses that we actually have. In the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 15, even though they died and separated by a chasm, he could feel, see, touch, taste, everything else. He was out of the body. So we do have our inner man. Last night we talked about how God's presence manifests in our life in proportion to the strength of our inner man. Now our inner man, if it's strong, you would have all five senses develop. And the spiritual realm, you touch and feel and taste this natural world by your five natural senses. You touch and feel the spiritual senses by your five spiritual senses. There's a spiritual sense of sight. We know from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, there is the eyes of our understanding. 
There is a spiritual sense of hearing because Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 tells us, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Not natural hearing, spiritual hearing. Where you can hear spiritually. And there are, uh, there is such a thing as a spiritual smelling because uh, Paul talks about us being the fragrance of Christ. In, that is in Corinthians. And then in Philippians 4, it talks about their offering as having a sweet savour unto the Lord. And uh, then we know from the, uh, the Psalms where it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we know in the book of Revelations, when John was given something to eat, uh, when he tasted it, it, was, uh, it would taste like honey, but when it entered his stomach, it, it was bitter. So those are not natural things. Those are spiritual things he's experiencing. Spiritual, uh, he's parting in some sort of spiritual substance. And uh, we know there's a spiritual sense of touch. There's a spiritual sense of tangibility that is there. All the five spiritual senses. But sometimes in the spiritual world, we are like babes. You notice that when a child is born in a natural, the child's eyes still cannot focus properly. And a little fetus or infant or baby is learning to acclimatize to the fine natural senses. It's learning to turn the head to the direction of the voice. Learning to see clearer. Before it takes time for all the fine natural senses to work properly and develop. In the same way, when we were born of the Spirit, our spirit man has five spiritual senses. And those spiritual senses can grow and develop. By those spiritual senses, the Holy Spirit communicates with you. The Spirit speaks with you, to you. By which spirit contacts spiritual world, soul contacts the soul realm, physical contacts the physical realm through the five senses, five spiritual senses. And so whenever God is moving and flowing, it has to flow in those manner. The only thing we need to differentiate is whether it's our natural and eliminate all natural senses before the spiritual. And you know there's no other way that could ha- take place. Then you know there's a spiritual sensation that you're having and you identify it and flow with it and see where it leads you to. The gifts of the Spirit that function in some of our lives. Like last night we encouraged some of you to flow and sense the Spirit of God with your spiritual senses. Now sometimes, sometimes to sense uh, the spiritual senses we must develop an ability to close our natural senses. And sometimes through training and meditation on God's Word, people have the ability to do that while they seem to be still functional, while others need to isolate themselves. But it's important for us to know that, for example, I have known it many times that many people, uh, especially when they are on the age of death, or uh, uh, where some of the natural senses are being short-circuited and faulted, the spiritual sense comes alive in those areas. It is like we cannot focus properly if both are operating. But when you have the ability of shutting down the natural, all the distractions of the natural, you would develop an ability to hear, to sense with your five senses, the spiritual. And it's important to develop that ability. Some of us grow up in farms where you know, we're isolated from noise. But some of us grow up in cities where there's so much noise around you and you're trying to study. And you learn a habit of not being distracted. Shutting out the noise mentally so you could concentrate. Some of us need that in this physical world that we live in. Because it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy for natural world and you have to keep your Sensing of the spiritual there. It takes training. In the training process, some of us may need to isolate ourselves quietly 
till our spiritual senses are fully awakened. And uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapter uh, 5, we talk about those who desire, let's look at that in Hebrews chapter 5, to grow. The difference between uh, maturing and not maturing has to do with our senses. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled. Hebrews 5, verse 13 and 14. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, it looks as if that the word senses, notice plural, it has to be spiritual sense and at some point, it, there is the sense of the conscience alone. That's how limiting you can put that verse to. I want to give opportunity to various interpretation of that scripture. But I want to expand it a little bit, even to define the word conscience, which is the Greek word sunidesis. And uh, the word conscience has been translated in the Bible in general as a consciousness. Conscience has been used in our fallen world to discern right and wrong. That's a part of us, the English definition we know. But it is more than that. It's a general consciousness of the spiritual realm. Of course, in that realm, you know what is good and what is evil. So we talk about the difference between those who, need, who take milk and the solid food is in their senses, train or exercise. Now, I want to point to a translation of Sunai Desis, which is the word conscience, in uh, the Bible in Corinthians, to show forth that the basic understanding includes, and I have analyzed the word sunidesis, which consists of uh, two Greek words combination of sun, which is together with, and the word uh, desis, that uh, in general it speaks of a consciousness. Let's look at uh, Corinthians, First Corinthians, where we talk about uh, our conscience. Chapter 8, eating idle food, the right or wrong of eating it. In the end, he concludes according to a person's level of consciousness of what is right and wrong. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol. Until now, it is as a thing offered to the idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, the word consciousness and the word conscience in that verse is the same Greek word. But you try to translate both as conscience, it makes no English sense. Because it says here, however, some with conscience of the idol. What conscience of the idol? It's a dumb idol. Because in the Greek understanding of the word conscience and sunidesis, it involves more than just a sense, an English definition of conscience of right and wrong. It's a sense of consciousness. Not natural consciousness, but consciousness of another realm. Good and evil, right and wrong of the spiritual realm. And in fact, I've done a thorough study of the word conscience and its implication in the New Testament. Look at the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. And... Uh, In the book of Hebrews, he speaks of chapter 9, verse 14. Something happening to our conscience. Something supernatural in the New Testament. Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? From dead works to serve the living God. 
What is he purging out? What, what dead works is inside our conscience or consciousness? Here, dead works represent your consciousness of the law, your consciousness of the things of this world that are dead and separated from God. Consciousness of everything that has deadness inside. Not just right and wrong, everything. But the blood of Jesus has cleansed your conscience so that your conscience is now no more an organ, an invisible spiritual organ that senses right and wrong. It becomes an organ that senses the consciousness of God, consciousness of spirit, world, and consciousness of the level of faith. Obviously, in Romans 14, when it talks about conscience, and 1 Corinthians 8, when it talks about conscience, he's referring to people who are weak in faith, strong in faith. And he's talking about their conscience sensing their level of faith. Faith, faith is faith. Belief in God. The real genuine belief from the heart. So our conscience is no more an instrument just to sense the Ten Commandments of right and wrong. But the conscience in the New Testament has become an organ to discern our faith level coming forth. That we walk according to our level of faith and revelation in God. Of our own consciousness of what God has revealed to us personally. So that for example, and not one Christian may have walked with God so, so closely that they have faith to live without medicine. They believe they can be in divine health. That's their real faith level. And then a new Christian who's new to God and their faith and relationship with God just developing and they see the other brother and they want to follow but in themselves their real faith level is still at a level where they may need to take medication. So they may need some natural help. They cannot go all the way without. Their conscience will tell them that they need to believe God, pray over the medicine, take it still, and be healed and whole. Which is different from the first brother. So the conscience in the New Testament, which is a different level of consciousness, has, has now played a different role from the Old Testament or old role that it used to play alone. It still plays that role of right and wrong, of course. But it's expanded and increased. Turn with me to the book of uh, Timothy. Timothy. And now, we look at uh, Timothy, 1st Timothy, chapter 1, verse 5. 1st Timothy, chapter 1, verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. Again, it's kataros, pure heart. The same pure heart as in Matthew 5, verse 8. From a good conscience and from sincere faith. The purpose of command is a good conscience. Then you look at verse 19. Having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. So our faith, our conscience, tells us our level of faith. As to whether you could launch yourself in the walk of faith at that level or not. It's a different function of the conscience altogether. The general idea of conscience, I bring it before you, is a consciousness of the spiritual realm. After all, how can we tell what is right and wrong besides God's word? Because there are many things outside God's word. In between the lines. How do we tell what is right and wrong? And we know we need a measurement. We cannot just uh, do it like, every, like the book of Judges. Every man does what is right in his own eyes. There has to be an absolute of right, right and wrong. That absolute is based on who God is. And our conscience or consciousness is linked to that. And that 
absolute right is broken down in our individual lives so we sense and walk with the level of rightness with God as we grow accordingly. That's where the road of conscience is. I talk about this consciousness of God in the spiritual world so that we could operate. The five senses, spiritual senses, are how we encounter the spiritual world and some of us, like in the natural, are stronger in some sense than in other sense. In the natural, some of us are stronger in our hearing and ears than other people. Musicians who could hear tones and miss uh, a, a wrong tone that normal people might not be able to hear. They train their ears. Musicians train their ears. Artists may train their eyes. And uh, their very profession requires them to be able to visualize and see colors before they bring it forth. And uh, uh, athletes train their body, their consciousness of their body, every fiber of their being to bring into play. So some of our natural early professions rely more on some senses than other senses. And we, we by, by virtue of training, and by virtue of following those professions, we develop more acuteness in those natural senses. So much so that some of us, I remember when I was uh, one day with one uh, tribal person from East Malaysia, we were walking in some parts where it is semi, uh, semi-tropical jungle. He could hear things I couldn't. I'm a, I was brought up in a city. So in the jungle he said, do you hear that? I said, what? <laughs> where? So that's just an animal up there. He said, then he looked and said, where? I can't see what you could see. I could hear what you could hear. He has trained his natural senses more than me in those areas by virtue of his life in the forest. So in the spiritual world, some of us have a natural inclination to some areas more than others. Which is why last night when the Holy Spirit began to flow, some of you, began, you have a leaning towards your touch sense spiritually. So you could begin to feel some things called, I call intercessory sensations. And, uh, and that is sometimes used, as you, as you saw Pastor Brett, using it in his soul, where he sensed the pain in the soul. Or in whatever area. It could be used to sense the pain of another person's physical body. Some of us are more inclined to hearing like uh, one of the pastors mentioned, he has this word that comes to him. A word of knowledge. And he receives it in word form. Because your hearing, your inner hearing is more sharp than your feeling. Because as we begin to move into the Spirit, some of you might have gone back last night and say. I don't know, I don't feel anything. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Now, we realize that in the natural, if we, have, if we all have five natural senses, if one or two of our natural senses are gone, we are more limited than others. That would be affecting us. In the same way, in the spiritual, if one or two of our spiritual senses are not as functional, we are more limited. And so, we need to understand that unless you really have all your five senses globe, none operating, which is very rare, very extremely rare, I don't know, at the top of my head, I think you know, it's as rare as probably one in 6.5 billion people. 
which will mean that at this very moment you could be the only one. <laughs> Since there are only 6.5 billion people on earth. <laughs> we do have at least some of our spiritual senses functional. So for some of you, it could be your eyes, where you are seeing, but you're not sure. You're like a, a baby. Do you know a baby cannot focus the eyes yet? And even in the physical, when you signal to the baby, the baby seems to be you know, looking all over the place. So in the spiritual, the Holy Spirit is trying to show you some things in the spiritual realm. And you're like, is that me? Is that really my imagination? Or is it really, do you see something? You're not sure? See, it's all this uncertainty and no one taught in those areas. So here we are going around with you know, half-baked spiritual senses. <laughs> and it's terrible because we don't know. And all the time we're in doubt. We don't realize all these areas can be trained. That God has actually, which is what we always find out in the Bible, that God has already given. We were just not looking in the right places. So some of us, our eyes are more sensitive to the spiritual realm. And we see like almost the eyes of our imagination. And some of us, our smell can sense it more. I know one particular evangelist who has a heightened sense of spiritual smell. He can smell demons. And I asked him, can he smell angels too? He says, still developing. <laughs> so I said, why of all the things you want to smell? <laughs> you smell demons. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, and, and he, he came from a background where he's a former uh, kingpin gangster. So he was converted, born again, baptized in the spirit, became an evangelist. And, and so he has a keen sense. Well, I know we're walking down the street with him, normal place. He goes, demon in that person. <laughs> so I said, where? He said, there. <laughs> there is his smell. You know, I, I don't have that, that same area. You know? I don't think I want to. <laughs> you know, how bad the demon smells. <laughs> right? And then people come to the front you know, to be prayed for, you go... <laughs> Special anointing. Eh? <laughs> you minister to them. <laughs> Thank God. Eh? Praise the Lord. Some of you might have that special gift, you know. You got God. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> and and uh, so you got an extremely developed sense of smell. Some people experience uh, uh, taste. taste. I only had that one time. And I was praying for a person, as new to spiritual sensation, and I was praying for a person, suddenly there was a bitter taste in my mouth. I didn't know what that was. I knew that I did not have any bitter herbs before, for the last 48 hours. And I, I, you have to eliminate the natural, remember, don't jump to conclusions. You know, don't, you know sometimes you say, you know, and you, you feel some pain, and somebody here has a backache, you know, it's your own backache. <laughs> Sensing, <laughs> trying to place it on somebody else. <laughs> so you have to eliminate all those things, you know, of your own or people around you. So we we have to to eliminate those things. I eliminated all those things. This is very strange, and and I went away still wondering. But a few days later. The person, uh, the, the, the person had some situation where the person we were praying for actually was suffering a deadly sickness and uh, the person died. And slowly I, I realized that that was a taste of death that I was sensing in my own way. Now remember, it may be different with your lives. Okay, we all slightly feel differently. Uh, we are all unique. And our sense might be slightly different. But we had to figure it out for ourselves. Remember, manifestation, interpretation, then application. So once I understood it, 
Sometimes when I minister, I stand in front of someone and I get that taste again. I knew there was a spirit of death. And it would be very easy to tell the person, look, you know, there's a presence of death here. We have to take authority. Or we find out if there's an open door that you need to close. So the ministry becomes sharp because I have found and discovered manifestation, interpretation, and I could apply it. And it's just that tongues and interpretation, all the other gifts of spirit could flow in that manner. But however we flow, I want to bring forth that all these things that we're having are in the Word, although I have been sharing much without quoting the Scriptures. Look, turn with me to the book of John. I'd like to give all the scriptural basis. John, the Gospel of John. When Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit and His coming and His work in our lives, He says here in verse 26, John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, John 14, 26, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, notice very carefully the work of the Holy Spirit. He will show you all things and bring to your remembrance. The act of remembering is a thought process. It's thoughts. So the Holy Spirit, when He works, He does affect our thought process. So that sometimes your inner hearing is so close to your own thought process. Then you wonder, is this my thought or God's thoughts? Because there's a thought process coming forth. Now, just to help you hear the Spirit clearer. Remember how some of you, when you were seeking something from God or direction or you're wanting to learn. When you read the Bible, and the Bible produces thoughts in your natural mind. But you get some other thoughts flowing that seem to be speaking to you, teaching you things that you were reading. That is the voice of the Holy Spirit in your thoughts. That was what it sounds like. Sometimes when a preacher is preaching, a man of God is preaching, and you're hearing the sermons and the thoughts that are flowing forth, in your thoughts and mind, another type of thoughts flow in a different direction, with a revelation that flows into something you were seeking God in. That is the Holy Spirit doing the thought process. So the Holy Spirit, my friend, is closer than you think. You just didn't recognize Him. You see, just like sometimes we all, we all have been so deceived by any, we are negatively geared. So that, for example, when, uh, when, when uh, uh, we feel God doesn't, uh, we feel God doesn't hear us, you know. God doesn't hear me at all when I pray. Then you, God really doesn't hear you? Yes, He doesn't hear me. Alright, scold God. Say something terrible about Him. You want me to scold God? Yes. Since He doesn't hear you, you can say anything, right? He doesn't hear you. <laughs> scold Him, scold anything you want. He said, but, but He will, yeah, He will what? <laughs> he will hear me because we are negatively geared. Think about how conscious people are when they do something wrong. Oh, God knew. God heard me. I said the wrong thing. We know God knows and hears when we are doing all the wrong thing. How can we know all the right thing? We have no confidence that He heard us. We have been negatively geared. So we have to unwind ourselves and realize how easy it is for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. There's a whole lot, whole lot of things we've got to remove and be cleansed away from to allow the Holy Spirit to work easily in our life. And in the same way, as it's, it's as close as your thoughts, which is why Romans 10 tells us in the context, you know, uh, 
who shall rise up to God and you know bring him down or whatever the circumstances are. And it says, God is in your heart and in your mouth. Talking about the presence of God. He's as close as your thoughts. It's just differentiating the line of your thoughts and when there's a Holy Spirit quickening. A different line of thought. How will I know, you say, with the Holy Spirit? Test it. Test it. And as you begin to test it, I mean, God is open for us to learn, to be trained. And as you begin to test it, you begin to know what it feels like to have those thoughts. So that sometimes when just it flows, you say, ah, it begins to sound like a thunderbolt to you, even though it's just a different line of thought. Then you know it's the Holy Spirit. It's that gentle, that gentle still voice, like Elijah discovered. No, it's not the earthquake, not the fire, but the still small voice of God. That was God speaking to him. So he says, close, as your very thought process, for we are spirit beings, your thought process is touching on the realm of the spiritual. So soft, so gentle, but yet it's him. Now, it doesn't take much for a mighty miracle to happen. It is only in our mind that we make a sickness and disease that is so terrible that someone has three months to live, harder to heal than a simple headache. It is our own conception, not God's. As far as God is concerned, healing is healing, His power is His power. The same touch of Jesus to heal a headache is the same touch that it takes to heal a person who is dying. And all we need is just to connect it together and flow with God in the simplest way to recognize that that's Him. And unfortunately, you have to actually test it out in your life. Test it out under the guidance of the Word. Test it out with an honesty to be corrected. Test it out with love which is the important thing where I will lay out all the scriptures first, then I will conclude with the love of God. Let me finish the scriptures first. In the book of uh, John chapter 16, it says here in verse 13 to 14, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So you will always know what is about to take place. Something on your inside. In verse 14, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine, and declare it to you. Now, included in the declare is a show it to you. So, we have shown that he's close to your thought process. He's close to your inner imagination and eyes. And for that, we can throw in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, where the eyes of your understanding shall be enlightened, or the word be flooded with light. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. Our understanding has eyes. And I have a whole series of teaching where I study the word imagination in the Bible. Remember imagination from Genesis 6, which was a wrong imagination. God saw that the imagination and the, and the works of man were evil continually. It was the word yet, sir. And in the New Testament, it's translated into the word dianoia. The essence of noia, which is the inner areas of our imagination. So in the things of the Spirit, just as the Spirit world is as close as your very thought process, 
the spirit world is as close as even your imagination. Now, that is not to say that every single thought is of God. In the same way, we're not saying that every single imagination is of God. But what we are saying is that in that dimension, you are contacting that realm. And we need to know, just as we need to know when the thought process is the Holy Spirit's production, you need to know when the imagination process is the Holy Spirit. But he's the one painting the pictures that you see. Why is it sometimes, some of you ask, when you pray, when you seek God, flashes come to you. Flashes of imagination. Almost like a life dream coming to you. Sometimes it's the speed. And I have learned in the area of flashes, just like I learned about tongues and interpretation where I can just Speak in tongues and interpret, speak in tongues and interpret. If the Allah of His Nasne, the Lord will teach you if you hearken to His voice daily. I could teach by speaking in tongues and interpreting the whole thing because I trained myself in the gift, in the growth area. In the same way, I've learned that the realm of the imagination also has many dimensions. Oh, yeah. Talk about praying in tongues for eight hours. It's Imagination stretch, 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 stretch. Here is where we get for additional tips, right? <laughs> but here, yeah. let me give you a few examples. When I began to talk about right imagination and learn that it's as close as your thought, and the imagination sometimes is the stirring of the spirit, showing you things, you know, that's for your heart. I began to understand some things too, some principles involved. One of the principles was speed. Say what speed? Like sometimes the picture comes so fast it's just like a flash of light. And you know how sometimes you capture some things on the video, then you slow down and play frame by frame. And I've learned that when you operate in the gifts of the spirit, when you're operating under anointing upon that you can miss it just because it was very fast. So I had to also be very fast to catch it. And at the back place, frame by frame. <laughs> and sometimes some of you, when you pray something, you just saw flash. And it's like you saw an angel, but you didn't see an angel. Because it's so fast. Usually it's not because it's fast. Your eyes are so slow. <laughs> His different speed. And the angels are actually already moving in very slow motion for you. In the spiritual realm. I'm just pulling your leg. So that you could see. Okay. And don't forget, all those framework is by uh, picoseconds. Some of you don't know what picoseconds is. <laughs> it's a thousand or microsecond. <laughs> Or fine, 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 little bit of movement where you can catch it. And sometimes I found that it's our problem. And sometimes I didn't pick up certain visions, and and sometimes after a meeting I go, I God, how can you didn't show me a bit more? God says I did. What do you mean you did? But you didn't catch it because it was so fast that you just got to be in that realm. And catch it as God. And the openness to the Spirit. So speed affects too. Because sometimes your mind is distracted, you're in a certain area, you're not catching what God is showing in a certain dimension. Speed. Another area I found was there are different degrees of vision, different depth. There's speed, there's depth. You know, this is sounds like the teaching in tongues again. Remember I talked about uh, pitch and volume, there's speed, there's depth of vision. Of course, if it's a very, very open vision, the field is wide. But sometimes, it's just very fast, a very faint one. And you could just miss it. You could just miss what the Holy Spirit was just showing you. So in each one of those gifts of the Spirit, you could be missing it. 
And, and I, tonight is a special because I believe God is quickening things in your life. So, a few more things, one more point we'll touch on before I conclude. And uh, besides this area of, of, of sight, of course there's touch and all the other di- dimensions uh, that God speaks, but primarily, I want you to know that when something is of God, i just touch on it briefly, maybe tomorrow we go into that, is when God moves, God's attributes and nature are within it. So if you have a thought that is condemning and lack love and peace and joy, it is not of God. If you have a vision, vision or imagination that is condemnation, that doesn't have the love of God involved, it is not of God. Whenever God moves and shows and manifests, behind it is His love. Because all the gifts of the Spirit, didn't it, wasn't it sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14? It's sandwiched by one of the greatest chapters in the Bible on love. Without love, tongues are nothing. Without love, prophecy is nothing. Without love, the faith to move mountains is nothing. Why does Paul put that chapter right in between there, 1 Corinthians 13? Because when, when you are trained and you know those areas, you become familiar with those areas, but familiarity is not enough because sometimes being familiar, i show it in this way. You open the realm and you could also be picking the thoughts of another person or picking thoughts from the atmosphere. Or picking thoughts or darts from the enemy. So being open also have our own liabilities that we have to deal with. Because you're now opening in, into a, a dimension that you never did warfare before. Now that you open, and that is where I found that some men of God, as they began to learn to operate that way, you have prophetic conferences where people teach you to prophesy. Correct? Just as we could have conferences where we teach people to pray in tongues and interpret. Where you could, you know, just pray in tongues and then whatever comes to you, just say out one word, two words and then people are bold, begin to let go. Same with prophetic conference, teach people to prophesy to one another. Then I remember in some of the conferences, sometimes they get two by two and they say, okay, prophesy one to another. And those two fellows look at one another and say, okay, um, uh, um, uh, God is showing me um, uh, um, uh, these things are... And they're trying to move in the area. But how do they know that what they are saying is, thus says the Holy Spirit, or my spirit perceive, or my soul is getting something? How do I know? See, they are not taught in those areas. They are not taught to release themselves by faith. But one also needs to be taught that you cannot say, thus says the Holy Spirit all the time. Sometimes you've got to say, I perceive. It's me perceiving, but still subject to more accuracy. And sometimes you could just say, my soul seems to pick up some things. Not sure yet. Let's be honest with ourselves. We are not there yet. If anyone of us are already there, any minister of five is already there, today they will be doing the works of Jesus and greater works. We are all on the way. And what I'm sharing with you is a result of years of experimentation, which we hope that in this short session, shortcut. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. So it took take a long time to experiment those things, so i just tell you in a few seconds. So that you could begin to be more aware. And the, of course, bonus counts. Those who are a bit holding back, holding back, they tend to lose out. Like Pastor Brad said, they tend to lose out. But bonus does count. Where you're more willing to make mistakes, honest mistakes, you're more willing to venture out, more willing to experiment, you gain more experience. And you become sharper. And 
So as you venture out and you're bold, you begin to sense things, we have to make ourselves purer to understand there is a difference between a real word from the Lord, a real vision from the Lord, even though it may not be great in depth or great, uh, uh, slow enough in speed to see in all full colors, but you could differentiate what comes from the Holy Spirit, what comes from your human spirit, and what is just a perception of your sensitized soul. It's important. Because it is possible, once you're in that area, it's, it's so easy to say, I have, uh, there is some disadvantage in the sense that if I were to hold anyone's piece of uh, clothing or anything from them, and uh, uh, the, uh, whether I am in prayer or I sleep on it, all of the person's soul life is unveiled. That can be a disadvantage because the, usually when I stay with a person, or in a home, whatever, pick up everything in their life. And uh, so, uh, it sometimes disturbs my own sleep, in the sense that, because of your openness to the area. But then you learn how to close the doors, so it doesn't disturb you. So, remember, for example, if right now, some of you in a natural have a fantastic super hearing, guess what? A little bit too much noise, you'll be very painful. Correct? With the strength, it's also its weakness. In the same way as you become hypersensitive and trained into those areas, we need also to pull ourselves back in the Word to realize that the love of God counts. Always the atmosphere of love must be flowing forth. And I want to conclude at least with this thought tonight. Some of you are seeking God for breakthrough and a miracle. I want to tell you the best position to be in. It's found in Second Corinthians chapter 3, where it says that as we beheld Him, we are transformed from glory to glory. The word beheld Him uh, and the transformation of glory to glory, where we see Him as in a mirror, is a Greek word, katoptrinomai, which is a very... Uh, yielded area where you are positioned where God can just flow and this is where it is if you need a miracle a sign one that, rem, I remind you again it's as easy to receive a miracle right now tonight at any time in your life in any area whether it be financial or it be natural or miracle or soul area transformation the main key is that Second Corinthians words, where you position yourself to behold Him. Now, what is that position like? This is what it is like. When you are concentrating on yourself and your need, you are not beholding Him. You are not beholding Him. You are beholding your need. Great as a need may be, Genuine as a need may be. And I just want to get that over because I sense tonight and in this series that we are going through that some of us are going to see powerful miracles. Signs and wonders which none of us can take credit for. But because Jesus himself is in our midst. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 tells us we unveil faith. See, unveil is to open ourselves into the spiritual realm. Unveil. We have unveiled ourselves tonight. We unveil face. We have taken, stripped aside all the natural things and differentiate between what is natural and spiritual, what is soul and what is spiritual. We unveil face. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. The word beholding as in a mirror comes from one Greek word. It's a long phrase that beholding as in a mirror. It's the Greek word katotrinomai. Katotrinomai comes from katotrinion, uh, which is a word for mirror. And it's the word mirror converted into a verb. So in a sense, it will be mirroring the Lord. 
you are transformed. Remember I thought of Christ in us. How do I mirror the Lord in me? By being exactly like the Lord, as close as you know how. So if I were you, and I have a tremendous uh, problem, a situation in my life that I need to break through from, or like our brother last night who have a great burden for a loved one in Wellington in a coma. You know how sometimes the problem that you face, the breakthrough you desire in itself, by looking at it, it looks like a mountain. And the more you pray away, the more attached you seem to be to it. The way is to free yourself from it. And to behold the Lord and allow the Lord to mirror Himself to, upon you to that. How do I go about it? It feels like this. You turn away from your own problem and you begin to pray for the problem of somebody else. It's the closest I can define it. So when you have a financial situation that you've been praying for so much breakthrough, you can't get it through. Because it's eating on itself, self-feeding in a loop and cycle. Like a feedback loop on sound, terrible noise. You turn away from that and become as the Lord. The Lord Jesus not one time thought of his need. Not even when he was on the cross. When he was on the cross suffering for us, taking our sins and sickness upon himself, he even thought of the simplest thing by taking care of his mother. Do you notice that? When the whole fate of the universe hangs on him, he looks at John and says, Behold thy mother. Looks at the mother and tells, Behold thy son. Took care. Takes care of others. The marvel of Jesus' life is that he teaches a principle. If you give your life to others, you will never lose your life. For he that seeketh his own life will lose it. But he that loses his life for the life of another, you will find it. And people are afraid to let go. They don't realize that God will never shortchange you. No one who is given of themselves are shortchanged by God. And you dare to let go and say, God, this is not committed to you. Let me now pray for the needs of others. You become a mirror. You have committed everything to Him. I mean, we all have real needs. Didn't Jesus say the same thing in Matthew 6 on the simplest things? The birds of the air, grass of the field, they take no thought for themselves. See, take no thought for themselves. But they just go on. And in the same way, He tells us, do not worry, do not fret. But He tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And His righteousness, all these things will be added to you. And that is also what holds every pastor and minister back. Because you rightly pray for your own church. You, pray, you rightly care for your own sheep. But the day you stop being selfish, and you care for your sheep, care for your church, by all means be responsible. But you also care for the body of Christ at large. Amen. You're not insecure, not afraid. It's the day God releases you and your sheep are more loyal to you than before. And you become a powerful blessing to others. Because the principle of giving and receiving operates in finance, in church, in church growth, in ministry, in every area. He that seeketh his own life will lose his own life. He that lay down his life for others will find his life. And that is mirroring the Lord. And you're praying for a miracle in your life and you've been so hard up in it. I understand sometimes it's so painful to see a dear one suffer. But you need to step back and let God come in. 
Because you could be the one, like Pastor Brett said, blocking God. We are our greatest enemy, not the devil. Because the day we die, Christ lives. The day we live, Christ is stopped from living true. And when you build others, you will be built. You, God will never shortchange you and I encourage every pastor in ministry. Never be afraid. Because the more open you are, the more God will bless you. And the same in any area of our life. That tonight God has granted a miracle, that wonder. Now tonight something special that God is going to do as we pray. Let's close our eyes and just shut out this natural for a while. And just a sense that flow of His Holy Spirit even tonight. Where some of you understand this principle and you're beginning to understand that realm. And it takes everything and whatever. Remember, every thought has a cause. Every feeling has a cause. Every sense has a cause. Some of it natural, some of it soul, some of it spiritual. But some of it comes from the very throne of God. And just a whisper from heaven can be an earthquake that sets captives free on earth. If we could hear that, channel it, and release it even into the physical realm. Because the spiritual world is crying for a voice. The Holy Spirit is crying for a natural voice to give heed to that which He whispers in our heart, that we shows in our heart. Father, tonight, as we wait upon you and your spirit, we know there are wondrous miracles, wondrous breakthroughs that are available for ministries here, wondrous things that you're doing. Not only healing physical bodies, which I already sense different healings, but also in breakthroughs in different areas of our lives. We thank you, Father God, that even as we hearken unto the realm of your Spirit, we ask for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to flow through in our midst, to reveal, to impart. Cause us, Lord, to know what your Spirit is saying to the churches. Cause us to sense what your Spirit is doing in our midst. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We praise you. Now, there are different things we would like to minister, but we would want to encourage, I want to step aside and allow the body of Christ to function in the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives in our midst. Whatever is functioning, giving into your lives, I'd like you to be obedient. If you're sensing some things in your heart and life, I want you to raise your hands up so that I can find you and allow you a chance to function in that gift. And we all function and flow with you. You sense something, you seen something in the spirit, or you think you did, you heard something. I want you to raise your hands high so that I can come to you. Yes. Just be reverent in the presence of the Lord. Thank you. fell asleep and you dream very shortly mm. that you're pastoring in our church mm. just now mm. a couple months ago ok so you had that that you remember that again ok that remembrance is the Holy Spirit speaking praise God we thank you Father we worship you let's just Keep the atmosphere and let's worship God. Just uh, sing in the spirit softly to help some of the people concentrate. Mm-hmm. 
I'd like to train you all to open your eyes in the spirit realm. Not your physical eyes, but your, your inner eyes. In the Mariana Lamash, Oranamani, Mariana Lamani, Manamaza, Manamas. And just see what is coming to your imagination right now. The Mahabaria did a Mariana Lamash. Uri Mariana Namani, Mariana Namasi, Biria, the Mariana, the Mariana, the Mada Maramash. Ramani, the Mariana, the Mani, the Mariana, the Mahamani, the Mariana, the Mas. Ramahade Gibiria, the Lamade Gibiria, the Lamade Gibiria, the Lamade Gibiria, the Jesus, 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 we worship you, Lord, we worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, we quietly just open your eyes for a moment, very briefly, because this is still part of the training session. And uh, very quickly, if anyone of you just saw a glimpse or anything, just uh, just uh, raise your hands, I, I, I'll give you an opportunity to share. Very quickly, because this, uh, we have done this before, and you find one thing. Even though we are all different, we seem to be seeing the same things. Okay, yes. It was like the light was getting brighter and then I just saw like angels, they were sort of gathering, they were kind of separating and then I could see Jesus. But I didn't, just saw a form but he was sort of the centre coming in the middle of where the angels were okay. gathering. Yes. <laughs> um, I simply saw the uh, sun rising, a brilliant gold sun rising and immediately that scripture came to mind from Malachi which says... Um, Sun shall rise with healing in his wings, and then the prophetic word just began to flow from there. But uh, just the same thing. Um, I just saw um, some bubbles, like they were like sound rings, while you were talking, and they um, saw the map, <coughs> saw the map of New Zealand, and it just went across it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I saw like uh, the Lord's standing there and had his hands out like that and flowing out from him was just like a radiation of his light and that and the thought was that he's always imparting. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I saw two things. Um, the first I've seen before and I couldn't recall where I've seen it. Um, uh, and it was a mountain and it had a waterfall um, the water was, it was like a rushing waterfall, but the water at the bottom was still, which was odd. Um, so that came back in my memory. Um, and then the second one was Jesus on the cross. Um, I saw Jesus laying hands on somebody in this church. She's wearing pink cardigan or something, the woman. Okay, that's good. Okay. So after we pray for those with pink cardigans. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just saw a washing line with all these uh, linen garments that were washed completely white, you know, very radiant garments. I saw an altar and it was uh, surrounded by light. Now that's quite a severe vision. I saw some things too. Wait, and anybody else? Yes. Initially I saw these black birds and I asked the Lord what made them like demonic spirits. And then up came the sun and it was brilliant and shining and immediately those demonic spirits disappeared and from the sun came out the Lord Jesus riding on a horse and the Lord reminded me that this indeed is the nation where the sun first rises. Amen. Now notice there were two visions similar seeing the sun and some with Jesus. Yes.
I showed a smile of my sister. It continues from last night. I saw the smile of my sister. And I just want to say that before I came here tonight, you mentioned about stepping aside. I've never done this before, but I talked to my sister to come. Come out because of the Christ that's in her. I just want to share about what our brother shared just now. Sometimes people in coma, in, when I was in the spiritual world, their spirits actually are up there. And so what you saw uh, just now was not just a figment of your imagination. Your sister did actually come to you. And you were actually talking to her. Just wanted you to know that. Uh, since... since 206, after the Lord brought me to the spiritual realm, all I had to do is close my eyes and the spiritual realm just opened up. So some of the things that you all saw, like uh, something opening up from above, that was also those things taking place. But it produces different images in some of you. Like a reminder of waterfall. Now, anything else that some of you have got? Yes. Uh, just sort of like a wave, just a wave of glory. The wave is a message Sister got on waterfall. Water flowing. Yes. Now, I saw it was like a rock coming towards me, but I knew it was the sun. I also saw a flower as well. Flare. Okay. Three people saw sun. Right. And anyone else? Yes. <laughs> I just saw a quick glimpse of the sky with the yellow, you know, yellow shooting over, orange. It's quite a number of us, quite a number of us in your imagination, you saw the flashes of light coming. Okay? That actually took place in the spiritual. And, and, and your sister actually came, spoke to you. And there's some things happening in the spirit. She is at the moment getting permission from the Lord and speaking to the Lord of what she actually needs to do. So, continue to continue to bring forth the love of the Lord in the area. And uh, if she accepts her mission, she will awake. So, watch and see she is in communion with the Lord. Any other areas that some of you are open? So are you beginning to open? Yes. Uh, I saw a marae with a cross on the top. Um, and I felt that God was saying that he's building his meeting house in this nation. Uh, a marae. Marae. A Maori meeting house. Oh, sorry, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> okay. A Maori meeting house. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for educating me. <laughs> and, uh, but our sister also saw some sort of ministry uh, that the Lord Jesus was laying hands, I believe, on this, our sister way at the back in the pink cardigan. That uh, when, when Jesus came, there was different ministry, and he was also ministering to you in some, in some manner. There are some things in your heart that you're speaking unto the Lord. Especially in regard to the area of your children, that the Lord is ministering to you and speaking into your life, and He's bringing a word to the Lord. How I know that is when she when she says that, and I I knew I mean there's not many pink cardigans. In fact, you're the only one. And um, so when the direction went to you, I sense other things flowing, other things that I know is not from me. I know Jesus was ministering to you. Jesus was ministering to your children. And I also know that you have prayed to the Lord for your children. And you're waiting for an answer from the Lord. And the Lord has come to you tonight and says that He has heard your prayer. He's heard your cry. Not to worry. They will come into His walk. They will come into His walk. He will see to it. 
he heard your cry tonight. So, see, from one word, it leads to another word, to another word. Remember how it's line upon line, precept upon precept. Remember, although it looks slightly more complicated, it's as simple as tongues and interpretation. When you have tongues and interpret, you have only one word. Then as you speak one word, the next comes, and the next comes, and the next comes. And you find that although you are in control, yet something else is controlling you, the Holy Spirit. And the same with ministry, the same with every area. And, uh, some, and uh, we're going to do... Uh, uh, so tonight, as you begin to open yourself, don't forget that the spiritual realm continues even when this meeting is over. And there is just something that has just awakened in your life. I want you to know, ministers of God, that if you open yourself, at the end of this series, you will be operating in the gifts of the Spirit in a way you have never had before. I know Jesus has want to come to you to awaken that in your life. So that that which you have longed to function in will function more accurately than it's ever before. But as we close tonight, I would like to invite the pastors who are here to come to the front here. Praise God. Would you come right to the front? And I'd like you to... Um, thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Father. When revival comes, there will be uh, those of you who will be so hungry and praying for revival will be greatly used by God. I know that for a certain fact. And I know in some of your hearts, you are very, very hungry for God. And I know that you have desired and things of God. And I do know that Jesus really, really wants to impart something into your life. Something special. Some opening of the Spirit in your spirit, soul and body. I'm going to pray Ephesians 3 for your life tonight. Especially in some way. We thank you, Father. I invite the congregation to stretch forth your hands towards this. Father, I bring before you these precious, precious ministers of yours. Father, some of them have gone through things that only you know and they know in the secret place where they have strived and they struggle and they have prayed and they have cried before you. We pray, Father God, that you would con- hear these cries, Lord, and you have heard them and you remember these times, Lord, that they have cried out to you. Father, they cried for direction, they have cried for encouragement, they have cried, Lord, for finding the place that you want them to be in. We bring them before you tonight, Father, you, O God, who have called and who have chosen them. Oh, Father, you, O oh God, who has anointed and placed this call on their life, we ask, O oh Father, that you would cause to come upon their heart and life, O oh God, that the Spirit of the living God would strengthen their inner man. Lord, build strength into their spiritual muscles. Build strength into their spiritual inner man. And open, O oh Lord, all of the spirit man to the realm and dimension of your spirit, O oh God. 
stretch their inner man, O oh Lord, to grow in you and cause that Christ to dwell in their hearts, in their spirits, O oh God, that they would know, O oh God, all the length, the breadth, the width, the depth, the height of the love of God, that they would be rooted and grounded in the love of God, that together, Lord, with the saints, they will comprehend, they will receive, they will be enabled, O oh God, to receive all of the fullness of God in their lives, O oh God, that they will be established, O oh God, in your love, established in your ways, established in your spirit, that they may know the dimension of the Holy Spirit, that you anoint and call them to. I pray, Father God, that even at night when they sleep, they will dream dreams and see visions. I pray, O oh God, when they are awake, O oh God, that they will see visions and hear your voice and word. I pray that 24 hours a day, they will sense a flow in the dimension of your Spirit, because they are ministers call of the new covenant, O oh God. To minister in the spirit of the things of your spirit, O oh Father. And Father, we pray even now, Lord, that you anoint each one of them afresh, O oh Lord. With your fresh oil, O oh Father. I pray, God, through your Holy Spirit, that you would cause gifts of your spirit, Lord, to be sent forth into their lives through your angels and through the ministering of Jesus, O oh Lord. Ministering personally, one by one, unto their lives, O oh Father. We praise you. We thank you, Father. Let a quickening, an awakening, a sensing, a dimension of the Spirit be imparted into their lives, O oh Lord. That which you have predestined in their life, way before they were born, way before they know you, the gift and the calling that you have chosen them to have and to be, establish it in their lives, O oh God. Make it tangible to them, O oh God. And all your loved ones, O oh Lord. We thank you, Father God. We praise you, Father God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And now we want the pastors here and the minister to anyone who wants to come and be prayed for at the end of tonight. We invite you to turn around and face the congregation. And uh, those of you who need to go, do feel free to go. Those of you who feel that you need to seal that which God is doing in your life through the laying on our hands of these ministers of God. And uh, as we uh, just uh, pray and worship the Lord, uh, do feel free to come forth. Yeah, some of your different needs. I know that there's at least uh, three, three, three uh, uh, men here and two in the middle section, the back, and one about the third row from the front who are praying for, for financial financial breakthrough and different different things, uh, different needs that you have. That as you come forward that tonight you're gonna come differently. You're gonna come really laying your needs at the throne of God. And you cut out three no my. You 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 look away from your need and begin to think about the needs of others or similar in your situation and channel all your energy towards them, knowing that in blessing them you are blessed. Even as this pray for you. And if you need a, need a miracle and healing in your life, tonight is your night. Tonight there is an anointing of the working of miracles. And if you release your faith tonight, receive it tonight. So let's come reverently and allow any one of these to minister lay hands on you to pray. And as they pray, some of them here may operate in some of those things. And pastors, I encourage you, whatever God gives to you, Speak the word, whatever, be bold. In this atmosphere, it's alright to move into that dimension. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all rise together. And those who need to, those who need to go, feel free to go. Those who want to minister, come right now, one at a time, to these who are in the front here. We thank you, Father. Holy Mary, 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 Come on, for That's right. Prophesy. Speak. Operate the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, be bold. Be bold. Step out. Ora madhe geberiya tere biriyan tiriya tiriya tala ma shiriya dalabat 
Oh Jesus, we worship you, Lord. Barra bahate kiberi atala mash. Barra madenge madi atala madi kiberi atala bati kiberi atala bati. Barra madenge beri atiri 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 atala bati shiri atala bati shatala bati. Barra madenge beri atiri atiri atala bati kiberi atala bati kala bati kiberi atala bati. Barra madenge beri atiri atiri atala bati kiberi atala bati kiberi atala bati. Rabadi Kiberi Atalabas, Shadalamas, Lama Rabadi Kiberi Atalabas, Deri Atalabahati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabas, Karamadi Kiberi Analamadi Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atabas, Karamadi Kiberi Atalamati Kiberi Atalamati Kiberi Atalamas, Karamadi Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalamati Kiberi O Lord, we worship you, Lord, Ramati Kiberi Atala Mate Kalabache Kalabash. O Lord, Ramati Kiberi Atiri Anana Mahati Kiberi Atala Mate Kiberi Atala Bash. Naramati Kiberi Atala Mate Kiberi Atala Mate. Shalala Mate Kiberi Atala Mahasherala Mate Kemachala. Sarabati Kiberi Anana Mate Kiberi Kabachala Bash. Gurra mate kalabate kiberi atara mate kalabash. Gurra mate kiberi atala mate kalabate kiberi atala mash. Gurra mate kiberi atala mate kalabate kalabate kalabash. Gurra mate kiberi atara mate kiberi atara mate kiberi atala mash. Lord, we minister to this house, O Lord, O mash. O flow forth in the spirit, Lord, O mah babari atala bash. O Lord, Ramahati Kiberi Atiri Atalamati Kiberi Atalamash. Ramahati Kiberi Atalamati Kiberi Atalabash. Naramahati Kiberi Atalamati Kalabati Kiberi Atalabash. Naramahati Kiberi Atalabah Sadadamati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalamash. Rabati Kiberi Atalabah Sadadamati Kiberi Atalabash. Rabati Kiberi Atalabati Kalabati Kiberi Atalabash. Rabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati. Rabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kabash. Rabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Sadarabash. Naramati Kiberi Atalabati Kalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kalabash. Rabati Kiberi Atalabati Kalabati Kalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kabash. Rabati Kiberi Atalabati Kalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Ramati Kiberi Atalamati Kiberi Atalabati Atalamati Ramati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Nanamada Mada Mada Garamash Nanamati Kiberi Atalamati Kiberi Atalamahat Atalabati Kiberi Atalabati Alamata kalabati kiberi alabati kalabati kalabashara 